All right, good morning, everyone. We're, we're f- about five minutes past. I, I had all of you out here and those that are online. I know we, we have kind of a smaller group this week, I think probably because of school and stuff. I think I, think I will. Um, I'm just hearing a little bit extra feedback or like noise in the monitor, so I figured I would turn it off, but uh, good morning, everyone. I, I'm, I'm actually kind of excited about what happened, what I have to present this morning. Now, yeah, it's, and it's funny because I, I was, I, whenever I present information, I have no clue what it is when I start off, and it slowly forms, and usually it's the morning, morning of where I start to figure out what I was actually supposed to be doing. It's an interesting way to, way to work. Um, it's fun. I enjoy it. I'm excited at the end. I don't know where I'm going at the beginning. But hopefully what I'm presenting this morning is not just for those who are here, those who are online, but even for the future, that I'm going to start to develop some themes and understanding of Scripture to really help us to move forward in a lot of the mission and calling that God has on this church. And part of what I wanted to you know, begin with is just saying good morning, <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and, and I, I and I'm. It's really exciting to see all of you that are here, and I, I'll say that I've been really excited lately because I started to see some things about the mission and calling of what has happened over the years. That both pastors Henry and Donna, when they began here, they were very. Um, there, there was a, an emphasis on the people. The church body being involved. That's why we we have an open mic. That's why we do some of the things we do, including starting to work with our community in the ways we can, is because in order for the church to really thrive and grow into the future, it's going to come not from a few anointed individuals who have figured it all out. It's going to come because the body of Christ learns how to function in the gifts, learns how to work together, as we all learn how to do this, I mean, I, I might as well make it very clear that my, my journey is I was, I, I came here as a newly born again person years and years ago, and slowly over time, I grew into the position that I'm currently at. But if I hadn't taken a step out in faith when I did, as a, a, and as I did, including making mistakes, I wouldn't be where I am today. That's the reality of it. And so if we're going to wait for people to figure out how to do it right in order for us to do anything, we're really going to find ourselves stuck in the mud. We're just going to, we're not going to have a place to go. In fact, even this morning I, I was praying about this, and, and I, I do want to start off with prayer this morning before I even begin. But part of the point that I'm going to draw out of this is we just need God. In order for this whole thing to work, we need God. And I have a lot of scripture that I want to read this morning, but um, hopefully it'll be intriguing to you, and hopefully it'll make sense as I go through this. So I just want to start with prayer. Father, I pray that you would work with us today. Teach us according to your word. Give me your words to speak. Help me to understand what you would have us understand. In Jesus' name, amen. So with that said, part of what happens when I present information is it's usually because I have to go on a journey. It's not because I figured something out. It's usually because I'm figuring something out. And so hopefully as I'm figuring something out, you can figure out something with me. And in order for, for me to, to feel like I have something to present, I do need to figure out what the trajectory is. Where am I going? I know for the past few years, I've studied storytelling. And it was something actually I started studying as a young man because of... Um, I drew comic books for a living, so I had to figure out how a story works. And it dawned on me at some point I, I, that, I think I've mentioned this before, but there's this, this term, uh, denouement, which refers to, it's a French term, but it, what it refers to in storytelling is really when the plot ties together and you figure out why you've been watching this thing for two hours, you know, a movie, right? So what happens is that a character will will either openly state something or somebody will confront the character and say, 
this is what you've really been doing this whole time. And they go, oh, that's what I've been doing. And then we as audience, depending on how satisfying that is, we go, oh, wow, that's really cool. That's what we were doing this whole time. Right? So for me, even as I'm looking at scripture, I'm asking that same question. I'm saying, okay, so God, Father, where, where, where are we going today? We have to be going somewhere. I can't just be reading random scriptures where we just go, uh, huh, that was a lot of scripture. What, why did we do that? We have to figure out where we're going in a trajectory. And what was kind of cool, though, is that what I do when I make my notes is I underline certain parts because I'm like, I have to remind myself, what am I doing? Why am I looking at the scripture? Why did I pull the scripture out? But as I underlined and I went through my notes, I went, wow, this is kind of cool. Because actually, I'm trying to figure out if I want to spoil it, but I guess I will, I'll spoil it for you, is that I was reading, and I'm not going to read this to you up front. I'm going to actually read it at the end. But I was reading about Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, it was, a, it was it, right in the middle of it, starting in verse 14, is where they've been baptized with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, and then they've gone down and they're you know, sp- speaking in tongues, and people are going, whoa, what's going on here? Are you guys drunk? What's happening? And, and Peter starts to explain to them what just happened. But what, what's interesting to me is this ties into revival because the conclusion of the matter is that these people, people's hearts were pricked. And then they say, well, then how do I get there? And then, so what happened though, is I asked that question in prayer. I said, okay, God, I want to understand how we can get there. And the surprising thing that happened is I forgot that I even asked that question. And then I just started, then I had another question come to me. I, I'm almost, sometimes I wonder if I'm having the question or if God is proposing the question to me so he can answer the question for me. So the question that I'm actually going to begin with was a question that came to me next. And then I'm going to start reading through some scriptures around this. But hopefully we can afresh at the end of this, I'm going to read Acts chapter 2. Hopefully we can grasp what was so revolutionary the first time it was said. Because I think the danger in Christianity is we've gotten so accustomed to these terms and these events as historical monuments, so to speak, that we go, oh yeah, there's the Lincoln Memorial, oh, there, there, there's, you know, and we kind of go, that's nice, but we don't grab hold of why we're looking at that. So hopefully, as I kind of go through some scripture this morning, you can start to go, wow, this is what I'm supposed to be grabbing hold of about this event, so that we can... Maybe not. Maybe we can, on some level, be pricked at our heart and go, whoa, wait a minute, I, I need this. I, I, I didn't even know I needed this, but I always did. So the, the question that came to me second was from Matthew chapter 23. I want, I, I'm, so I'm, I'm kind of moving right into what I want to talk about this morning, but I, I really was I was curious about something in Matthew chapter 23, and I'd actually read this, this scripture before, so I don't want to go through all the scriptures in there, but there was a certain part that was just, it, it was like the scripture kept playing over and over in my head throughout the week, and I was like, well, why, why am I thinking about the scripture? I, I didn't understand the point. In fact, I'm looking at my notes, and I think that I didn't include as much as I want to include. But the point that... that where this begins in Matthew chapter 23, which I'm not going to read all of, just part of it, is that Jesus is talking about the scribes and the Pharisees, and they want to have all the best seats. They want to be known amongst the people. They want to have this reputation. They want to be someone amongst the people. They want to have all the, the great stuff. So I think I want to read it starting in verse 7 first, that this is what Jesus says, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, rabbi, rabbi. But be not you called rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. See, that right there is a very, very important part of where we're going today. All of you are brethren. See, part of what I want to draw out in this conversation is that you're important to the vision. 
But part of it's not to have zeal without knowledge. What is zeal without knowledge? Well, I was kind of the prime example of that. I really loved God. I was very excited, and I did a lot of goofy things in the meantime trying to figure out how to do that. Hopefully with time, I still have the same zeal I had as a young man, but God is teaching me how to harness it correctly to be more thoughtful when I sp- speak and operate with other humans so I don't just go... go uh, I'm not, I'm not just going off and just doing random things. Uh, what a bull in a china shop, I think, is the the term. You know, just making a mess of things, trying to help God, but really not being thoughtful about what the Word of God has said. But the key here is that I want to draw it is: for one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. Verse 9, and, and call no man, fa- man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. And neither be you called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. In fact, hopefully what I'm doing today will be to serve you Scripture for your growth. And whoso, whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Now, the question that came to me out of these scriptures, is, he's talking about, be not called rabbi, neither call any man your father. I, uh, there was this question that came to me, why does the church openly flaunt these things? These are openly done within certain parts of Christianity. You'll find plenty of men called rabbi, and you'll pl- find plenty of men called father. In Christianity, no less. Even after Jesus said this. And that was a question that came to me. I was like, well, why does this happen? Well, part of it comes back down to verse 8, what I just read. For one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. And I want to start to peel back what that means according to Scripture. And what, what's fascinating about this that I started to find, see, what, what I start to do is, it's very key that when I'm asking questions, I expect the Bible to answer me. So I didn't start reading books this week. I started reading the book and searching in the book for the answers. Now, one of the things that was interesting, is I, as I told you, I want to read Acts chapter 2 at the end. So I went back to Acts chapter 2. Then I, I, re, I rem- realized that, of course, he was referring to Joel, Peter is, when he talks about, um, uh, I'm going to kind of skip around my notes, that, that he will pour his spirit out on all flesh. So I went back because I thought, let me read what's happening in Joel. Because, see, I don't believe that God is just giving us a conclusion. He's telling us how to get there. And I was surprised when I found the most important element that I I think is so simple in this scripture. So I'm reading from Joel chapter 2, starting verse 12. So Joel chapter 2, starting verse 12. Now, I'm I'm leaving out certain parts of this only because of the fact that there's elements that were prophetic and otherwise, but I wanted to grab hold of what was relevant in the future and relevant today because there are parts of these prophecies that are relevant in the present and the future, because they're principles of God's kingdom. So I'm reading from Joel chapter 2, starting verse 12. Therefore also now, says the Lord, turn you even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning. Now here's the thing that's really cool is verse 13. It says, and rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repents him of the evil, and repenteth him of the evil. What's interesting to me is, is that beginning part, and rend your heart, not your garments. Because right? part of what they did, they did in the Old Testament when they were grieved is they would, they, would rend their, they would rip or rend their garments. But he's saying, don't do that. Rend your heart. There was hardness of heart there. There was withdrawing from God. But here's what was really kind of neat about this, is where this goes. Who knows if he will return and repent and leave a blessing behind him 
even a meat offering and a drink offering unto the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify and fast, call a solemn assembly. Gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth of his chamber and the bride out of her closet. Now, he, verse 17 is where I found the key behind the transformation. Because I think we all want the fruit of all the good stuff. But where all the good stuff comes, including the pouring out of his spirit upon the, on all flesh, begins with verse 17. Let the priest, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar. And let them say, what are they going to say? Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not your heritage to reproach. The heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among the people, where is their God? What I'm hearing in this scripture that's so important even today is a return to saying we need our God. See, revival is not just about you and me doing stuff and watching God do things with us. It's first a turning back of the heart. Say, we need you, God. We need you every day. We need, need you every moment of the day. See, because look, look what it says in verse 18. Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be satisfied therewith. And I will, be, and, and I, and I will no more make you a reproach among the heathen, but I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the... Uh, the, the utmost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savor shall come up, because he has done great things. Now, what I want to point out as I'm going forth is I want to point out how often it says the Lord will do this. Verse 21, fear not, O land, and be glad, for the Lord will do great things. Be not afraid, you beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree bears her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield their strength. Be glad, then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord for your God. I mean, rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat, and the fats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I, that's the Lord, will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God that has dealt with wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my, my spirit upon all flesh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now, where I'm going to be going is kind of going to be a surprising place in this, and so I, I don't want to spoil all of it up front. But might I suggest to you that part of the reason why revival tarries is actually pretty simple. We're not saying, hey, God, we just need you. We're adding to it. We're removing from it. Maybe we're even selfish in it. See, what's interesting is that this scripture says the blessings come after repentance and acknowledgement of a need. It doesn't come before. 
So maybe when we're in a dry and desolate land, it's time to cry out to God and say, hey, I don't, I'm not crying out because I of need. I'm crying out because I need you. And I always needed you, and I turned my back on you because I figured I could do this. I need you just once in a while. But we don't need him once in a while. We need him every day, every moment of the day. Whether we realize it or we don't realize it. Now, oh, it was interesting. I was thinking about Esther, and I found something very fascinating in the book of Esther that I want to draw out. I'm not going to read the whole of it. I'm only going to read a few verses from it. But as things were going poorly, Mordecai sent word to Esther. So this is chapter 4, verses 12 through 14. But I want to point out some things about the, where the church can go in a bad way, too. Because I think that what Mordecai's words were to Esther are very relevant to us, too. I, I remember that, that Pastor Henry would say he was the hood ornament. Now, that was kind of half-joking, but really what it means is that I think he just got a lot of the flack. He said a lot of things that were unpleasant or uncomfortable to people. He stirred people to think, and a lot of times people weren't happy about that. As, as he, this is one of his phrase, phrases. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you mad. Because <laughs> that's what he experienced with people. They would get angry when he would teach them what the Bible said. And I, it was really funny. I remember hearing him saying in old recordings, he's like, listen, I'm just reading you the Bible. <laughs> and people would just be like furious about what he's saying. But look, look at what is said in Esther chapter 4, starting verse 12. I want, I want to read this. So it's Esther 4, starting verse 12. And they told, oh, I, I, I'm, yes, and they told to Mordecai Esther's words. Then Mordecai commanded to, an, commanded to answer Esther. Now listen to what he says. Think not with yourself that you shall escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Now, we're not the Jews in captivity, but let's make sure that we don't even hear in the United States or even around the world, or because of a certain position, it's not going to touch me. There's no threat to my life. I'm good, because that's part of what is being said here, is that Mordecai said, listen, don't think that just because you're in the king's house, you're exempt from the consequences. They could come after you, too. And that's what, why I brought up that whole hood or ornament thing. Because part of what the challenge is that I want for everybody in this church, not just at a leadership level, is to take seriously, we all have a calling according to God. Now, I think the problem is that we think, well, is it big or, you know, it, what is it supposed to look like? It's pretty simple, and I'll make it very, very simple for you. When, what God is telling you and convicting you of personally today, are you doing it? That's it. You may think it's a small thing. You may think it's an unimportant thing. I don't know what he's telling you, but I'm going to tell you if he's telling you it, it's important. Don't judge by the scale of it whether it's important or not. Stop resisting him if you have. If there's something in your life where God has been tapping on the shoulder, don't say, eh, it's a small thing. No, say yes. Because I think part of the journey of this church and part of the revival that we need to be a part of is not just an event. We need to be prepared to teach people according to the ways of the Lord. But if we don't walk in those ways, we can't teach people those ways. I think, I think that Father God is troubled with the church being hypocritical. We're trying to show the world something that we ourselves are not engaged in. But the more that we choose to engage with him in the small, simple things. So please don't think I ha you have to go out and change the world, but it's actually in those small things you do in your personal life that all the fruit comes from that will change the people around you. The answers that a lot of people are looking for are pretty basic. They're like, well, I got kicked out of my house and here's what happened. There was a fight here. How do I even deal with this fight? Well, if you have an answer for how to deal with the conflict in, in a household because you've learned how to deal with those conflicts in your household, 
you suddenly have the way of life to somebody. I think we think that it's all grandiose, but it's those simple, small conclusions that come from you applying Scripture to your life that can change the world. Okay? But, but what, it, what did it say in verse 14? For if you altogether hold your peace at this time, that means be quiet, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. This is a fascinating statement that, is, that was made by Mordecai. He says, listen, God's going to take care of Israel. So if the wave is coming and God is, God is sending revival on the planet, it's going to come. So if it happens, it's going to happen. I'm going to trust God that, that his will will take place. But here's the problem. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. So do you really want your, your own life to be maybe not preserved because you don't follow along and you just go, well, it's okay to just sit on the sidelines. Don't sit on the sidelines. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. See, the one thing that I'm learning is I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be blunt about how I speak. I try to speak to a large audience, but the only thing I can do is speak to the, the range of experience I have. So if you can find yourself in my range of experience, then I can speak to you according to scripture. But here's the good news. There's more than one, one of me around. There's all of you. And you can speak to people that are like you in ways that I can't speak to them. So rather than trying to craft myself into a Swiss army knife, it's better to just say, here's where I am at. Hopefully you're going to glean something from this, and God will use you in that sphere of influence in your life to speak into other people's lives and help them according to the way that you speak. Now, now this is a hard one. See, I'm, I'm telling you, like, as I read, I was looking through these scriptures, I just, I just copy and paste them together, and I start seeing something, and it's like a picture forms. So where am I going? Well, I'm going to go to Jeremiah chapter 1, because it's literally what I was, <laughs> I was thinking next. So I'm going to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4, because I want to challenge something that you might be thinking right now, according to scripture. Jeremiah chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came forth out of the womb, I sanctified you, and I ordained you a prophet unto the nations. Now, verse 6 is the excuse. And maybe you're thinking this excuse right now about your own life. So what did he say? <laughs> then he said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. I'm unqualified. In my journey, it's important to understand where I came from. Because some of you just saw my, some of you have seen my journey from when I first got here. But I, I, I don't know if you understand why I started doing what I did. When I first came here, and some of you may not understand, know this journey, but when I first came here, I came out of the world. Like, out of the world world, not out of, like, the Christian world world. The world, world. The, the doing whatever I wanted to do when I felt like doing it, and I didn't have any boundaries on what that looked like. But when I came out of that place, I had tested something out which I've mentioned before, which was to isolate. I was very afraid of people. I had fear of man. I would feel bad around people. I hated being around people, so I secluded myself. I wanted to feel safe. I wanted to not be confronted with people who would make me feel uncomfortable. So I isolated myself in my room, and I thought it would get better. It didn't. It only got worse. It only got worse. And it, it was astounding to me. I was like, I don't get it. The more I isolate and the more I just go inward, the worse this gets. 
So when I came here, and there were a few times I made a fool of myself at the open mic, and I would just say, and sometimes I would just say things that were kind of dumb. But, you know, I, and, and I'll tell you, I felt foolish. Don't get me wrong. I did feel foolish after I did those things. And there were many times that I felt all this self-hatred. I was ready to go run and hide and never come back. And the devil was right there telling me how stupid it was that I did that. But here's what I realized. That's the reason I kept going. Is because I'd been hiding out and I knew what happened there. So I said, I, I can't go to hiding anymore. I've been hiding my whole life. I'm done. So I guess I'm going to look like the biggest fool ever, but, or God is going to get hold of me. And at some point, I think what happened is he realized my heart in the midst of all my foolishness. He realized I did actually want to grow up in the midst of being a really silly, foolish guy. And he, he didn't want me to destroy his kingdom, so he started teaching me a few things. But, if, but in order for this church to really grow up, yes, we want to go knocking door to door and we want to meet people, but there also has to be a maturity that grows up here where we can all care for one another, speak, minister, but it's because of something very basic. It's that you take seriously the calling on your life every day to be the person God is calling you to be day by day. That's what it is. And, and you're going to have to set your face like Flint to make a determination, a pretty simple one. I can't go back. If you think you can go back, and withdraw and hide away, we're in trouble. See, I think that one of the things I'm starting to realize at this juncture, and it came to me this past week, and this is really where, kind of where I'm going, is there's not going to be at, I don't think there's any point at which you're going to just throw caution to the wind and just let go of everything and not feel a single thing whenever somebody comes against you. Now, what do I mean when I say that? I mean, there are people in history, even Pastor Henry, where they said a lot of bold things that made people angry sometimes. But, you know, when you look back at revivals, that's part of what happened. There would be people who would say stuff that would get them in trouble that other people didn't like. But what happened is the people liked it. The average person was like, this is what I'm not hearing in my church. I want you to know that I spend time counting the cost. I do. So when I come up and say these sorts of things, I'm fully aware that I might get blowback because somebody doesn't like it. I know that. I'm not unaware of that. I'm not so raw, raw excited that I don't realize that some people not, might not like what I'm saying. But should I stop saying it because somebody may not like it? I believe that true maturity in God is can you love people enough for them to hate you? What does that mean when I say that? When I say, can you love people enough that, that you're okay with them hating you? That means, can you love them enough to say things that will make them angry at you because they don't want to hear the truth, but you're willing to say the truth because if you didn't say the truth, they wouldn't have that truth. That's the challenge for us. It's unpleasant. We don't like being hated. We don't like being reviled. I think if you're a normal human being, you don't like that. But, you know, telling somebody that's going wayward to repent, probably not a thing they want to hear, but it's the thing they need to hear. I really do believe that a lot of these revivals in the past were, were begun because people started to say stuff that, other, that the church maybe even at the time was saying, don't say that. They said, I'm compelled by God to say it. I can't do what you're telling me to do. I have to do what God is telling me to do. And then people came out of the woodwork going, 
water. There's water in the desert. It's time to drink. And that's how they would transform the world they lived in. So, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 1, and I'm going to go back to verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child. For thou shalt go to all that I shall send you, and whatsoever I command you, that thou shalt command thee, thou shalt speak. See, what's great is that God is not calling you to go all wild and just scream in people's faces or just bang down doors. But you also can't be afraid. If you're supposed to open your mouth, please open it. Even if you're kind of shaking a little bit. And you might be sometimes. Like, do I, should I really, am I, are you really telling me to talk to that person? Okay. But see, you don't know what may happen if you're willing to take that risk. Verse 8. Be not afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. There, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. I was thinking about reading the next verse, but I think I want to leave it there. Because I think that's where I want us to end with that part. I'm not done with all the, the scriptures. But really, we have to trust he's putting his words in our mouth. Remember, Jesus had no sin, and yet they wanted to stone him on multiple occasions. So just because God puts his words in your, your mouth doesn't necessarily mean people are going to like it. But this is part of being willing as a church to start to overcome in the midst of a world that's very confused and really lacking. Now I want to read from Matthew chapter 22, starting verse 1, which I love because it includes everybody. See, I'm purposely reading everything. Because remember, I, uh, where did I begin? I was talking about not being called master. Remember that? See, I want, us, I want to open the doors to a place of simplicity. I'll, I'll even share this with you. I, I, I don't know if I shared this publicly, but I'll share it with, with you again. If you've heard it, then you're hearing it for a second time. There was a season where I didn't want to speak in church. I wasn't an elder at that time, so. But I, it was a test. I was like, you know, I feel like I get up in church services just too much. So I'm just going to be quiet. And regardless of what thought I get, I'm just going to not do anything. And it was interesting because it was probably about, I don't know, eight months that I did that. But it was interesting because it was a test for me. I was asking a question. Am I in the flesh? Am I just doing this for my own, you know, to be somebody, to say something? And what was interesting is I found that during that time, something fascinating happened. Is I got the sense that God didn't allow what I was supposed to speak to be spoken by anybody else. It was very interesting. But so what happened is it felt like whenever I didn't do it, it was like there was this little bump in the road. <laughs> just like, boom. Like it just seemed like there was something missing out of the flow of it. And I watched that happen for months. And I, at that point I said, okay, I think I am supposed to speak. But why am I saying that in this context? I'm saying it because what I learned in that season was not that I'm so important, but that I'm part of it. And you're part of it. I think that one of the things that's most important for, for this church at this season is really we can't have any, how should I put it, optional bodies, body members, body parts. We can't view anybody as optional to the kingdom so you can check out and not do your part. 
I just don't think that, that, w that, that this place can keep doing that. Where we need to be willing to work with one another at whatever level God has called us to just say, I'm available and not just disappear. It, it's, it's as much a mindset question as anything else that, we, that I, I, I really want to come against this idea that anybody here is optional. If I don't say anything, if I'm not a part of it, nobody's going to miss anything. No, that's a lie. There are no optional members of the body of Christ. And I would hate for people who are here to miss out. What if God were to add 3,000 people in a day? He's done it before. I wouldn't want you to get lost in the sea of people. I want you guys to be able to stand up and help those people because you've been here for a while. Okay. That's what I'm trying to say is because I think sometimes we look at the numbers, but I look at what we have currently, and we have to start to view ourselves through the lens of nobody's optional here. Nobody's journey is just on the side somewhere. But it doesn't, here again, it doesn't mean that we have to become super, spiritual superstars, but are you willing to say yes every day to God about what he is telling you personally? That's all. Are you willing to read your Bible and pray according to what God has put in your heart and keep doing that every day? That's how we keep going together. All right, so let's see. So I'm going to read from Matthew chapter 22, starting at verse 1. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they would not come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatling are killed, and all things are excuse me, ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. Then said he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go you therefore into the highways, and as many as you shall find bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both good, no, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not a wedding garment. And he said unto him, Friend, how came thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. Now, I'm not going to leave you with that negative thing, because actually it goes right into where I'm going to go next, and I didn't even know I was going to go there until this morning. But there's a point that I want to make before that. When he went into the highways and the byways, wherever, to find somebody, I'm part of what he found, I'm okay with that. But the point is, he's calling everybody to come in. But it's your decision as to whether you want to do that, whether you want to be a part of that. And so that leads right into Revelation chapter 3, starting in verse 14. I feel like I, I said this at church, I might have said it elsewhere, but I'm bringing it back into the context of this because it's very, very important. Revelation 3, starting in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you were neither cold nor hot, I would that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and 
and neither cold nor hot I will spew you out of my mouth. That's pretty awful. But here's the thing that I want to point out. At this point, people start to speculate as to what being hot or cold is. I'll tell you what it is because of verse 17. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. What is this saying? It's saying something very important to those of us especially who are living in the modern world. If we're just going to reach out to God because we have a problem, then we are a problem. If you just so that what what was happening in the Laodicean church was pretty simple. They weren't really that interested in God because they figured I've got a full belly. I've got enough to eat. I've got enough clothes. I'm good. I don't need you. And he said, "Do you don't realize you're naked and you're out in the cold and you have nothing?" See, part of what the the challenge is for us around the world we live in today is I appreciate the conveniences that God has given us. I'm glad I have electricity. My electricity went out this week. I made sure to call the electric company to make sure I get it, got it turned back on. I appreciate it. I like air conditioning. I like having a full belly. I like those things. But the danger for us is to say, if I have those things, God is kind of optional. I talk to him sometimes when I need something. Whereas, what, what did Jesus say? He's saying, uh, hello, that's not why you're in relationship with me, is because you can get stuff from me. You're in relationship with me because you recognize you have a need that goes beyond a full belly and air conditioning. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou may be rich, and white raiment that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness do not appear, and anoint your, your eyes with eye salve that you may see. See, there's a reason why I didn't actually define the one, the one without the wedding garment, because this scripture defined what the wedding garment's about. It's, a, it's being clothed by God. It's sanctification, as God works with us to change our character day by day. As many as I love, I rebuke chase and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Verse 20 is so important. It's a shame that this is, def, is, is used as something for the unbeliever. It's, that's a wrong interpretation of the scripture. Verse 20 is talking to a church. And I trust that this is not about our church, but can we please be mindful not to allow this to happen? Okay? So don't feel condemned, like, oh, this is talking about me. No, 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 no. Let's not go there, but let's go, hey, Father, I want to make sure this doesn't happen because there's a problem if this is happening. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. To them that overcomes will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. See, this goes right back to what I read in Joel. We have to really start to view our life through the lens of, I need you every day. I need you every moment of the day. When I'm up here talking, it can get dry. I've heard myself speak before, and it's dry. That's some bad stuff. There's a reason why I read so much scripture when I'm up here. Do you know why? Because it gets dry if you hear me trying to spout off about what I think. At some point, when I start spouting off on what I think, we get so far away from Scripture, I just feel like it's dry. Because it's just a personal opinion. We've all got a personal opinion. But do we have the Word of God to back up that personal opinion? 
Are we going to walk where he wants us to walk? So where do I want to go in this? Well, I want to go back to Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 14. And hopefully when we read this, our eyes don't just kind of glaze over and we're just going to go, oh yeah, I've heard that before. But we really go, wait a minute. Peter is talking to me. He's talking to me. He's talking to anybody else who will listen. Because I trust that, especially in this church, we believe in baptism with the Holy Spirit. Well, then let's grab hold of that gift and say, hey, wait a minute, it's for work. It's so that we can represent God wherever we go. Wherever you go, he goes with you. See, part of the secret that I would say about revival is revival should be going wherever we go. I mean, Peter was a walking revival. Just sounded like a thousand here, three thousand there. Wherever the man went, stuff happened. But I think it's so fascinating. Here's the thing that I love about Peter. He made a lot of openly bad mistakes when Jesus was alive. This is a guy who, you know, denied Jesus, even rebuked Jesus about the fact that he wouldn't go to the cross. But he did walk on water for a little bit. But here's the thing that I realize about Peter is that at some point in, in our church, we have to get beyond fear of failure. I think a church that can get beyond fear of failure is a church that's going to turn the world upside down. Fear of failure and fear, fear of rejection are huge hurdles to the church. But the reason why, I mean, the reason why Peter would walk by and his shadow would touch people and they were healed is because he wanted to know God. And he didn't care if he made a fool of himself in the meantime. Like, I, I, at some point, he just said, I don't care. I'm following you, God. And I think that, too, what happened is that I believe that Peter made some decisions. In fact, I... I, I I gather that that's why Jesus asked him a few times when he was restoring him, when he had denied Jesus, that part of what was happening inside of Peter was, all right, Lord, I'm not going back. If somebody says, do you know Jesus? I'm going to say, yes, I do. Whatever you have for me, come at, come, come at me with it, but I'm going to say yes. He was done denying the Lord. He did it three times, and that was the last three times he was going to do it. Do you know Jesus? Yes. In fact, what happened when, when they prayed and, and, these, and somebody was healed? Peter made it very clear, we got to pray in the name of Jesus. You can't stop us because you're not the one who ordained us to do this. God did. There you go. He made the decision that, yeah, I messed up, but I'm not going to do it again. Let's keep going. Okay. So it's not failure that's the problem. It's Do we let that be the thing that stops us? So, hopefully you've heard this before, but I hope hope that we can start to understand it better after all the scriptures I've read to you before this. Because I want to read a few scriptures. I'm going to read to verse 39. But I want to start at verse 14. So Acts 2, starting at verse 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of of Judea... And all, all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Did it say some? Did it say just the elders of the church? All flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Do you realize what happened in Peter Peter quoting that? Is that just suddenly everybody in the room is now a part of that vision. Do you realize that? (laughs) What just happened? So children are involved in this? Parents are involved with this. Grandparents. doesn't matter what generation you are. We are all called to this. 
And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, may I submit something to you? Maybe that's not just salvation as, as in being born again. Maybe we need to keep calling on him. Every day we need to be saved. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? Maybe you need that once a day. <laughs> hey, <laughs> I need some help here, Father. In Jesus' name, help me. Right? Every day. I, I, I don't think this is a singular event. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God, the Father, I, I'm adding, among you by miracles and, and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as you yourselves also know. Now, this is important to your faith, what was just said. Don't feel pressure when you pray for somebody. You are allowing the Father to do his work. As, as Pastor Henry would say, we are not the power. God is. But we're joining him. We are a point of connection with humans to say, may I pray for you that God would heal you. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate Counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speak, speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand and that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. This is, includes our eternity here. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. You don't have to fake joy. You have to ask Father God to teach you who he is and give you his countenance so you can be full of joy. I don't want us to fake it. I want us to go to the one to give us that joy. If you don't have it, ask for it. Don't feel guilty that you don't have it. And don't, please, by all means, do not pretend around us that you're happy. It's great today. The problem is your eyes give it away. If you're not doing well, we can see in your eyes. You can smile at us all you want, but if your eyes say, I'm not doing well, it still gives you away. So don't fake it. And you can say, you know, today I'm having some issues. But, it, but if, even if you have somebody pray for you in that moment, you still have to understand what they're praying for. They're still praying for him to give it to you. Do you understand? Even when we pray for others, we're not praying that we're going to give it to them. We're praying that the Father would give them a revelation, free them from some, some form of sin so they could have his countenance. Okay. Verse 29, men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this bef before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. 
This Jesus has God raised up, whereof we are all, excuse me, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which you now see and hear. I'm going to read that again. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, that's the Father, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, we receive that promise. He has shed forth this which you now see and hear. Do you realize what the scripture is really saying? It's saying, don't try to prove that Jesus died and was resurrected through argument. Be the proof. The, the, the Spirit of God in you is the proof that the promise was delivered. And that he is not dead in the grave. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. You are supposed to be that proof. Don't say, I'll prove it to you. Say, I have the proof for you. You want to see it? That's a difference of perspective. One is a lot of argument and talking. The other one shuts the mouths. Verse 34, for David is not ascended into the heavens, but he said himself, the Lord says unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make your foes thy foot. Until, excuse, excuse me, until I make your foes your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made the same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What, now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of, of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far, are far off. That's me. I'm in there. I'm afar off. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call I want this place to be transformed. I want this planet to be transformed. But I realize that the core of transformation, I wish it was just a moment, but it's a lifetime. I, I hope that this was edifying to you. I hope you don't feel condemned in it. But I wanted to present you with these scriptures. And I wanted to really let them tell you the picture. Because hopefully the picture came out in the scriptures. That when I read what happened in Acts chapter 2, you saw it afresh. Not like, oh, that's fine. It's like, whoa, wait a minute. That's there. That's here. That's what should be. I, I I believe that I want the moments to come where God does his work and, and, and wonderful things just happen in a moment. But I also think that there's something to be said about the moments you're not looking for. And I want those to happen too. So part of what I want to call forth and I and, and part of my prayer even now is that Father God would teach us, thank you, teach us how to follow him, how to work with him, but also that he would teach us how to number our days. Now, why am I saying that? Well, so we could apply our hearts unto righteousness day by day, and that we would learn how to not be a lukewarm church, 
and still have a full belly. I still like having a full belly. I'm not going to pray that I don't have a full belly. So I like to have food in my belly. I like to have electricity. I, I, I like those things. But can I still have those things and yet still be on fire for God? Be still desiring him, whether I have it, or, or here, here's another challenge in it. Maybe some days have an empty belly, but the same countenance. Whether full or empty, I'm always full. That's my prayer for all of us. And I'm going to tell you, we're not going to get there overnight. But it's a pursuit of the heart. This is, this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So with that said, I think I've said everything I can say, that I should say, <laughs> so I don't get myself into trouble. Um, I do want to go ahead and go into a few songs. It was really kind of neat. I'll, I'll share this openly. Is that I said, here's a couple of things I have in my heart, but I want to be surprised. So go ahead and figure out what, what, what the songs are, and I'll be surprised with everybody else. So I'm excited to hear what we have uh, to sing this morning. So if you guys want, wouldn't mind joining me, we're going to go into some songs now. <laughs>
Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit. And Father, thank you for showing us this morning that we need to need you. And Father, I repent for myself. A lifetime of thinking it was me that was doing the breathing and that it was me that was doing the talking, and it was me that was making things happen, when it was always you. Father, you're so good. Father, that right spirit that you want in us has to do with us knowing that we need a Savior and that it's not us. 
Thank you, Father, for revealing that this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. I think sometimes we have to be reminded that God wants to use ordinary people. And that includes all people. We don't have to be a special type of people, but a peculiar people that we must be. But God desires to use ordinary people. I kept hearing that word as you were speaking. And I think also we have to realize that all of us have a part and with that comes responsibility. But what I'm coming to realize is that in that, I'm not in it alone. I have God the Father, I have Jesus, and I have the Holy Spirit. And I think in the days and times that we are living in, God is calling for a people, a remnant of people to not be afraid to say the things that must be said or need to be said. But along with that, I do believe it comes balance because God is a God of balance and timing because sometimes we could say a lot of stuff and it could be the right thing that need to be said, but if the people hearts are not prepared to receive it, then what's the use? So I think for me, because I've been processing some stuff even before this morning services. I've been, I've been saved a long time, but you know what? That don't really matter. <laughs> Thank God that you saved, but it doesn't matter how long you've been saved. Being saved does matter, though. Don't be saved, okay? You need to be saved. But the time, you know, how long you've been saved is really not significant, I don't think. The thing is making sure you know Jesus and you know where you're going when you leave here. But I think even with that, from time to time, for me as it, uh, personally, I do inventory on my own walk with God. You know what I'm saying? So sometimes you can get so busy and caught up in the cliches and the church thing and going through the motions, and we forget. Well, I had forgotten sometimes who my first love really is and who's really in control. And you brought some stuff to the table this morning to help us to realize that, you know, we need God every second of the day. And I think we need to, as people, I'm not talking about the world. I'm talking about those of us that call ourselves sons and daughters of God or Christian believers or however you want to term it. I think for us to be the light that we need to be in this dark world, we first need to search our hearts to make sure that we are walking the walk, that we're not just talking the talk. You know, stuff can look good on the outside, and we have these cliches that sometimes run unbelievers away because we have all this churchy stuff, you know. And I've been through that journey. I've done it, been that, done that, bought the T-shirt, and I decided to get rid of it because, see, it doesn't work. Because, see, at the end of the day, sometimes you could just look at your own life, but this is what I do. How do I want people to approach me? You know, there are some people that I'll never be able to reach, but they are reachable. But there are some people that you may be able to reach that I can't reach. But you know what? It doesn't matter. What we are trying to do is reach. Just reach. Those that God bring in your presence, just reach, you know, and bring them in. And it might not be the Jesus, 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 Jesus stuff. It, it could be. I'm telling you what I know from experience just sitting amongst those that don't look like you, act like you, smell like you, behave like you. I mean, they, listen, they might be cutting the food. I'm just going to put it that way. Because you know how sometimes we don't want to be around people that disturbs and kind of upset stuff. And it don't look good on the outside. But they are seeking God. Because, see, that's how I was at one. People didn't want to be bothered with me. Because I was a, to them, I was a problem. But I'm so glad that God saw me in the midst of my junk. And he realized that I'm not a problem. But he was willing to deal with me. He sent the right people. Some people came. God did not send them to me. And I know he didn't. 
And before they left me, they knew he didn't. So all I'm saying is, let's remember that such was some of us at one time. You know, we can dress it up. <laughs> we good at dressing this stuff up on the outside. But what's really been happening on the inside? So with that, as I begin to do inventory of my own life, because do you know at the end of the day, when you stand before God that you're standing alone? I think sometimes we forget that. It's not based on what I heard here at Hope of the Generation or at my old church, New Life Church, or what the pastor said. Or what, that was good. That helped me with my walk. But at the end of the day, I will be standing before God alone. And we're going to have a conversation. And, you know, I can't pull back of my dad is a pastor. Well, my dad is a pastor. So dads know that don't work in heaven, y'all. So here's the thing. It may work down here. But see, this place is not my home. I have a heavenly home that I'm preparing myself, trying to day by day. Do I get it right? No, not every time. But you know what I love about God? I love him because he's so sweet. Not only that, he loved me in whatever state that I'm in. I come to realize that. He knew from the very beginning when he chose me from the foundation of the world that I would not be perfect. And you know what? God, the Father, the Holy Ghost, and Jesus, they did not have a problem with that. You know who has a problem with that? We. And a lot of times, the flack, if we want to be 100, the flack comes from other believers. And that's a shame. That's a shame. But you know what I sense in my spirit? As we, as a group of people, individually, do our own soul searching and get before God and ask him to show us stuff that he wants to work on. First of all, he'll be glad that we did, that we gave him an invitation. Because one thing about God, he does not push himself off on anyone. He can see you about to go to hell, make a bad mistake. Now, he will give you warnings, but if you heed not to the warning, God not going to just come in and just shake you and say, do this. That's not his nature because he forced his way on you. But he will prompt you by the Holy Spirit, and it's up to you and, up and me if we listen. But what I love about God, he got me no matter what. And I've come to realize as I hear the word, I come to church to build on what I've already prepared in my own private time with God. You, you hear what I'm saying? It's not a matter of coming. If you, if you come into church, let, let me give it to you. If you come into church, wherever you may go, every Sunday or however many days of the week you worship, to get your relationship with God, that, that's all you're getting? I'm telling you, you done messed up. That's not enough. It's not enough. You have to have your own private personal, intimate relationship with God. Because, see, that's what's going to stand when you stand before God. You can't ride the tail slip of somebody else's religion. They can give it to you. But let's not be deceived to feel like that's going to be enough. I feel like the message you gave this morning, for me, was ve very encouraging. And it built on something that I had already been seeking God about. Because, see, I know part of the gifts that God has given me, and I just like truth, okay? And I ain't saying you don't, but I like for you to give it to me straight. I don't want it sugar-coated because I don't function well that way. That don't work for me. Now, it might work for something, and I'm not saying if it worked for you, that's cool. I'm just saying we different, we receive different ways. So if you give it to me 100, I can work with that because I played the mother game. You know, I mean, I know your hand, so don't give me that. Give me the word. Give it to me straight because I'm on a journey. <laughs> we are pilgrims in this land. We didn't come to stay here, y'all. So I'm on this journey. So on my journey, God is taking me through many paths and connecting me with different people to help me get to my destination. And, Father, I want to tell you right now I'm so grateful for that. And I don't get to choose who he will choose. How cool is that? Because you know what? What God may choose for me is probably, I'll go ahead and say it, I probably wouldn't choose it if you want to be real. Because like I said, my pathway, even coming to this church, this would not have been my choosing. Don't get mad with me. <laughs> it's 100, okay? But God said, hear me when I say, God said, you go here. It's been over 10 years 
I don't regret it. Am I challenged? I'll be lying to you if I said I wasn't. But I do, I do not regret it. Because what I've learned, and one thing my dad taught me, is that when God speaks, whether you understand it or not, obey God. Just obey God. Like you said, you get flack for telling the truth. Hey, <laughs> what we going to do? We going to keep compromising or we just going to speak truth in love at the right time and all of that? That's going to come. But look who we serving. When we go home to be with him, what I want to hear said, now it's okay if you like me. I would like for you to like me, but if you don't, I'm cool. You know what I'm saying? But I'm talking about the Father. When I stand before him, I want to hear him say, well done. Thy good and faithful servant. That's the voice I'm waiting to hear. Because some things that we have to say, and y'all, I'm telling you, God getting us ready. People ain't going to like it. They already don't like it. But I'm, what I'm saying, the heat is going to be turned up. It's going to be turned up. So I feel like God is preparing us for the heat that's coming. And you know what? Listen to me on this. We need each other to be able to stand when that fire come. Because it's coming, y'all. It's, listen, it's not if it comes. It is coming. But if we got one another that we could connect and you got somebody that you can tell your truth to. You can't tell it to everybody because everybody can't handle that. Let's be, let's be real. But you need to have somebody that you can go and talk to to help you be steadfast, unmovable, and always abounding in the works of the Lord. I believe we can do it. Do you believe we can do it? We, we can. Not in our own strength, but I believe God just looking for a willing heart, a heart of obedience a voice for him, and I believe that it is here, and that's why I feel like God sent that message for us to begin to see, well, what is it, Father, that you will have me to say or do or not do, but asking him what part do you bring to the table? Amen. Well, all of this discussion today has got me thinking and reflecting. Um, Scott, I was going to say, when you first came here, you were always friendly with me. And I think that's because I came out of the world world, too. <laughs> and I was safe. And I think that's one of the things that I've done over the years and hope to have done is to be a safe place for sinners, that they could be loved and accepted and hopefully come to the Lord. Now, this morning I was listening to a service online, and it was a gentleman from uh, Tanzania, and he was uh, preaching in the style of Ron Hart Bonnke, and, you know, he, his message was, everybody should be saving souls that that's what we should be doing, out there saving souls. And I reflected and I thought, you know, I just don't relate to that. That's not me. And then he asked the question, what is your passion? And I would challenge all of you with that. What is your passion? And I reflected and I, I realized my passion is healing and deliverance and that's where I get really excited now just kind of skipping around you know I retired in 16 and before that my life was being health and when that chapter closes it's sort of like well okay what do we do now you know what's this retirement about and one of the things I've done is I joined Toastmasters and just would share, you know, my testimony and many teachings and just interesting things over the years uh, just because it gave me a, a vehicle or a way that I could do that. Well, about a month ago, a friend introduced me to um, 
Accra Speakers Club. And that this is another international speakers club. And so I joined this group that meets in, they're from Canada, Winnipeg. And it's truly international. A week ago, I was the only American on that call. And the age, I'm probably the oldest one. There's two gentlemen that are close to my age. And it goes down to a 15-year-old from Indonesia. And there's a handful of young people from Indonesia that are quite young, but they're so mature. And they just speak so well. You'd never know that they were as young as they were, except that they giggle, you know, and they act like teenagers. <laughs> well, yesterday, I got so excited. This young man gave a speech, and you know what he talked about? He's 17 years old, and he's a Muslim background in Indonesia, and he started talking about the voices in your head that tear you down. And apparently he'd been told, you know, you're too short, you're too fat, you, you must be gay because, you know, you're not real athletic and, you know, masculine, et cetera. And he heard these voices and he was able to articulate that those voices were from other people that had told him these things. And then he talked about how we were all individual, like a snowflake, you know, every person is different. And I, this kid is 17 years old, and, I, and, and I'm listening to this, and, and, and it was just amazing, and I thought, and I shared some of this, you know, I was in my 50s before I, you know, started following Pastor Henry and his teachings. I always thought the voices in my head were mine. I never separated them. And that's still an area of battle for me to think, you know, this voice is from the enemy. It's not my voice. You know, separate yourself. You don't have to listen to it. Tell it to shut up. But this kid, he identified it as voices from others that had bullied him and, you know, uh, whatever, and sometimes the voice in my head might be my mother being critical of me, you know. And anyway, I got excited, and there's an after party. Everything's on the computer, Zoom, and there's an after party where we just share, and, you know, so I tried to teach a little bit of being now. <laughs> and it didn't go over super well. I think I went a little too deep about spirits, you know. But see, this is, this is my path, is trying to learn how to speak to people that are so different in a way that they will relate. And, you know, Pastor Henry started me on this way back in the campground in the 1990s. And, uh, you know, when he put it on me, I, you know, like he said, well, you know, how would you, you know, talk, talk to a Jehovah's Witness or, you know, something like that. And I wasn't particularly interested, but, you know, it grew on me. And I really do want to learn how to bring the gospel to people so that they will be open and they'll receive it. And one thing about this group is it's, it's truly international. It's very supportive. They're not going to, you know, put anyone down or criticize them. It's just, and we were having a discussion afterwards one, one Saturday, and I can't remember what it was, something in the world that was going on, some political thing, you know, whatever. And we all agreed. I was just ecstatic, you know, young, old every religion from all these different countries and we can come to a point of agreement and i just think of my gosh in this country all the division and and you know pastor don has really been trying to bring about this unity and how important that is but i i was just thrilled to find other people different from myself who just viewed situations in a similar way and I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience. Thank you.
Well, what I would like to do right now is that obviously I don't know if anybody has anything else they would like to share, but in the meantime, I do want to give an opportunity for anybody who is interested in giving today. Um, if you go ahead and raise your hand here, but obviously online, if somebody's online, we should have links and stuff to uh, your ability to give online. Um, there are different forms and links, I think, on YouTube and otherwise. So. For those who are online, you can do that through the computer. Those, those of you who are here, if you would like to give, just go ahead and raise your hand so that they can pass out an envelope if needed. Uh, well, that said, too, I just want to, though, extend it. It, it. If there's anybody else who has anything they would like to um, share before we close things up, I do want to give that time. I, I was really excited by what was brought up. But go ahead and come on up to the front if you want to, if somebody has something. But um, I... Uh, I did appreciate what what both both uh, what everybody shared, and it was really good what you you got out of it because that was a a key part of what I was on my heart is that we can't wait for the fully formed I don't know <laughs> how how do I describe this some kind of fully formed the use that term that Pastor Henry would use fully formed like spiritual superstar, some kind of person where we're like, wow, this is just the, the perfect person. I, and and I, I, I really did relate to what Marsha was saying is, is honestly, we're just learning. I mean, even when we do it wrong, we're still learning. I think that's the whole point. Or if we do it partially right, partially wrong, I think we have to embrace that that is the learning curve. It's, it, it's a willingness to continue that's really where growth happens, not trying to find... I, I, I still remember going to pastor and your pastor Donna when I was first married. I think I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I feel like I keep retelling the same stories. But I I, I, I had just gotten married, and, and I, was, I was asking about conflict in marriage. Like, is it okay? We have fights and we have problems and stuff like that. Is there something wrong here? And I was asking, like, for advice. So I was like, so can you just tell me how to not have these problems in my marriage? Like, it was like I'd only been married for a few years at the point. And I remember they just kind of looked at me. And they looked at each other, and then just kind of they were quiet for a moment. And then they just started laughing. They were like, "No, that's marriage. You have to learn how to get through those conflicts. You have to learn how to." But I think we should view our our relationship with God and even our learning how to meet people in much the same way. And I, I think it's also worth also pointing out that the way I view this, I even tell this to people who are coming through for my life. You know, we can reach millions of people if each of us just meet, meets a few people at a time. <laughs> you, you, I mean, if, if everybody was to work with, you know, even over the course of a lifetime, 10 or 15 people, but we have thousands of people come here through here, you're, we're going to eventually meet a lot of people. I think the problem is we do think about just like one or two individuals and it's great. I'm not down. I'm not downplaying that there are some people who draw huge crowds. I'm glad they do within Christianity. I'm not saying it's a negative thing, but I think the danger is if we just view it only through that lens. There's the rest of us who just kind of meander through life, and then there's these guys who pack out stadiums full of people. But we don't bridge that to say, well, I don't know. It's a, it's kind of a growth pattern, and it's we don't need to go there. But can we still meet the people? that we're supposed to meet every day. So I, I, I don't know if anybody, uh, are there any uh, people who have uh, any envelopes? If, if you do, go ahead and raise your hand. I mean, just put it up in the air so that they can um, come and collect it. Uh, at, at least that's here, by the way, obviously physically. If you're online, if you're raising your hand, we're not going to collect your envelope. <laughs> but <laughs> with that said, Kenny, did you have something you wanted to share? couple verses that God uh, showed me some things like the Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ, who's, well, through him who strengthens me. And I, it, it dawned on me, I got an aha, like when I'm believing, like when I'm standing against um, fear or unbelief and doubt, 
that scripture can be applied because I can overcome them because of him in, who lives in me. And then there was another thing that God showed me in Isaiah 5.25 um, about the anger. It says, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he hath stretched forth his hand against them, and hath smitten them. And the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. I misunderstood that at one point, thinking, well, his anger, so he's stretched out. And in other words, he was always going to be angry at them, and that's it. But no, God showed me, no, that even though he was angry at them, and he was still angry at them, he's still stretching out his hand to them, saying, come to me. I want to save you. Come. That's how I look at now. And there was one more thing that I that Jim Faulkner with the Isaiah 58, that um, he's, um, the fasting, he, and he said unto them, the Sabbath was me, made for man and not man for the Sabbath. And then Adam made on the sixth day, entered Sabbath on the seventh day. And I thought that was pretty cool. And then think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And then Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, um, and which and one, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. And then yeah, I got the aha, oh. It's because I was trying to do the... Um, because I was in the temple for a while, and I was trying to do the Sabbath on Saturday and stuff and not eating pork and what have you. And then God showed me, I'm not, uh, okay, if I'm, if I'm at the temple and I'm doing their ways at the temple, I'm going to apply their principles in my life at the time. Or if I'm in Israel, um, you know, like mission work or whatever, I'm going to do their ways because that's their culture. But here, I'm in the church again, so I can still honor God with my life. And also, I was, there was this one question that I did not do. I go, God, what about the man on the stick with the sticks? He picked up the sticks, and um, he got killed. Well, it wasn't because he picked up the sticks. It was because of doubt and unbelief. It's because he didn't trust God and believe God that he was going to provide for him when Moses told, him, told the Israelites, okay, you, you don't pick up, you don't have to um, do anything with the manna. Don't do anything with the manna or what have you because I'm going to supply. Well, evidently the man wasn't trusting God and says, no, I'm going to do my own thing and not believe God. And because of his unbelief, that's what killed him. Not because he was doing something on the Sabbath. I kind of like this this morning. We, we have it a little different. People are popping up. <laughs> Actually, uh, it's fun to be online as well as here, but uh, we have a, a testimony that was texted in to me from uh, one of our dear brothers that's listening from a thousand miles away. Uh, and so here's what Paul said, and it's a testimony uh, from him, and I think it's very appropriate to what we're talking about. He says, hey, Doug, it had something to add to the open mic I think God wanted me to share to reinforce what Scott was saying about speaking when God is telling you to speak. And that was pretty much every testimony up here was that very thing. Um, when I found God, it was in prison, and there was a man handing out tracts every day when we would come out of the mess hall. I started taking them, and the Word of God would speak to me every time I took a tract. That is what got me to accept Christ and start reading the Bible. 
And then God would continue to speak to me in the Bible. But I asked him one day why he handed those tracts out. And he told me that God told him that he must do it and to pray for him because the Muslims in prison were threatening him to stop doing it. I was against God then in all my ways and had an antichrist spirit, but God's word came in an instant to change that and change my path. And I don't think I would be walking with God today without that man being faithful to speak and pass out tracts in a very difficult place to do that. Was that not an awesome testimony? And as a result of that, this young man, Paul, is just a formidable force for being health all throughout the world. And his testimony keeps us going every day here. Uh, and Father God knows what I'm talking about there. So thank you, Paul. God bless you. Well, one thing I do want to take a moment for, um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll resume with this, but I, since we did collect up the offering, Father, I, I do pray that, that uh, you'd bless uh, the money that was collected, that, Father, that, that you'd work with us to appropriately and thoughtfully use it for your kingdom and for your purposes. You should give us wisdom and understanding. And, Father, I pray that you would, would increase the fruitfulness of what is coming out of this place through what people give in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, with that said, that was really cool. I love that testimony. It was really, really neat. And, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm glad that it's coming across. That that's really what I wanted us to, to, to glean from this. And I even like that, um, even going back to what Marsha was saying earlier, too, because it just did strike me as something about what she was saying, is that we really do have different ways of interacting with the world. And that's what's so important is I, I don't want to put it in a cookie cutter. Because, I mean, the danger about emulation and, and, and copying is that may not be who God made you to be. So you just be you, living your life, but just be available. I think that's one of the cool things that Pastor Henry reminded people of. Be available. Don't, don't have your head down ignoring people around you. Sometimes you're going to bump into somebody who you don't expect to have an interaction with, and you're going to say or do something. And, and, and what I actually, going back to what Doug was even sharing with that testimony, is the man didn't even understand. It wasn't like God had told him, here's the man who, who's going to be reached and this other person's going to be reached. He's like, well, I'm going to be obedient. I just feel like God wants me to do this. I don't know exactly what he wants to happen from it, but I'll be faithful in doing it. I think that's what's kind of cool about this is we don't have to know. It's not about us. So you might be doing something, in, and the challenge is really it's your faithfulness to him. I think that's what we can't even judge by the fruitfulness of what we think happened. Right? He can't really even judge by, well, did I know that this percentage of these tracks I passed out or what I said to these people that I got a 50% win rate or whatever that thing is. You may think nothing happened. But at the end of his days, he's not going to be judged by what other people did with what he did. The question that God is going to have for him is, were you faithful in doing what I told you to do regardless of what you think it was supposed to do, right? You know what I mean? Like, I, I think we forget that. It's like we, we, sometimes we need to really be aware of the deception of the question of why am I doing this? I mean, it sounds good, right? Why am I doing this? What, what, what do you have for me, God? It's, well, maybe it's, don't worry about it. <laughs> it's just, just do it, and God will figure out what, why you did it. And, and maybe he has a, has a specific reason that you don't even know. I mean, who knows? Sometimes when I'm speaking or I'm doing something like this, it may not even be all of it that somebody needs to hear. It might just be literally one or two words. But they hear those one or two words and they go, whoa, that was what I needed. Well, great. Then it did what it was supposed to do. But but that, that's really kind of cool. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, <laughs> go ahead and come on. When you were sharing there, it just pricked my spirit on a couple of things. So I didn't hear the Lord wanted me to get up, but then my spirit just got pricked in. And um, I have uh, just the sweetest thing lately. Um, it's been for the probably past couple months, maybe three, four months or whatever. 
but I'll be, uh, <clears throat> I'll wake up and I'll have dreamt about somebody that I have not thought of for years. I mean, Lord only knows why that person was in my dream. And so um, because it's been happening more frequently lately, I have been sensing the Lord saying, I just want you to pray for them. So I just lay over, you know, uh, praying in the spirit over the top of them because I don't know what needs to be prayed for. But I have to admit, the people that have been in my dreams um, are significant. I, I think, you know what, I could see that person right now could be in a real challenging place. And um, there was one person lately who um, I knew she had like 12 kids. And I and um, and her her husband from the last I had heard had left her, and so why you know it was like the only thing I could think of was that God had divinely pricked my spirit through a dream, and so let's just lay the um, praying in the spirit over the top of them and let God do what He needs to do, and so um, so anyway that that's just been a neat thing, and then and then there was one other thing too because we we're talking about like what Marcia shared and. You know what we're the spirit of what we're we're sharing here. Um, each of us has our own own ministry and so on. But um, I've been been sensing uh, a commitment, which has been a good step of faith because I've needed to, you know, just be challenged in certain things. But there has been a um, an abortion clinic that the Lord has put into my my travels. And there was a sense in my spirit that I needed to make a commitment to, to be out there just to pray and have presence and, um, and some other um, support for others who were there. And so once a month, <clears throat> it's kind of been pretty much a commitment but um, for me to, to go there at a certain time on, on a Saturday. But anyway, all to say that um, last month, which um, in, my, in my sense of, of the commitment, and I was going to go up there for like about an hour and a half. I just sensed the Lord was kind of saying that. So I went up there, and there's some a little Catholic group that meets there too, and and they mostly speak Spanish. But it's just it's just neat. We connect and we kind of encourage each other. But anyway, they left, and so I was I was just there, and I just sensed the Lord wanted me to be there. And there was a lot of gals who were coming in there. You know, your spirit just it's a cha- you know it's 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 a challenge, but it's. Um, it's been it's been kind of a good challenge because it it stirred me to say, you know, what what am I to do while I'm here for this hour, or, you know, and and this is this is life for a lot of people, you know, that they're just not not really thinking about what they're about ready to execute and so on and so forth, perform however you wanna, but anyway, um, so so I was there last Saturday uh, a month ago and um, I just felt like the Lord said, okay, wrap it up. And so I was picking up, I had a couple signs, because I, I have a, a couple of signs. One is, can I, can I help you? And it's just a sign, because most of them, you're, you're, you're not supposed to get too close because you're on private property instead of public property and so on. So I just have a little sign, and, and, and I hold it up, and, the, and a lot of the women who come look at me, and it says, um, can I help you? Um, and then another one I, I have, I flip the sign over, and it says, can I pray for you? And um, so it's how I just kind of pray, and I just try to say, okay, what's the spirit of things as, as I'm there? And, and so, but anyway, um, <clears throat> I, I felt like the Lord said, okay, it's time to go. And so I wrapped up, and I was walking, and um, as I was going back to the car, um, I looked over, and there was a young man sitting in the back of a pickup truck, and his head was, I could tell, he was really somber. And um, so I said, you know, I'm just, I got to go, and I put my signs in the back of my truck, and uh, all of a sudden, right when I was about ready to get it to the, to the cab, I felt like the Lord said, go talk to him. So I walked over, <clears throat> and I said, hey, I, I, I've seen you out here, and I can tell you're struggling. And he just looked at me, and he said, yeah. And I, and I said um, something to the effect. I said, uh, I know these are, these are hard things to go through. And I said, uh, um, I know that um, I'm going to pray for you that you whatever decisions you make now are going to be the right decisions. And, um, and he looked at me, and I said, hey, can we join hands? And he said, yeah. Because I could tell he was just like in the throes of some real challenge. And so we just grabbed hands, and we just prayed. And I said, Lord, I, and I, I, I remember him. I think he shared with me his name. And, and so um, we prayed, and um, 
you know, I just said, God, come encourage him. Let him do what's right. Give him the strength to do the right thing here. Just encourage his heart in the Lord. And, and, and we pray, Father, in the name. He hit a cross around his neck. And I, I sensed that he was, he was a believer. And so, um, so anyway, um, I said, um, I think I said something like, um, you know, you hang in there and, and, and I'll, I'll just be praying for you, something like that. And we just had a real, I could tell there was a connection. Something happened. And so, um, so I went in my truck, and I was driving away, and as I was driving, I looked back at him, he was sitting in the cab, and he was like, like this, you know, just, and I, and I had my window, I think, was down at the time, and I waved to him, we just, you know, because I could tell something had happened. So uh, I gave him my card, too, I have my little business card, so um, I said, if there's anything I can do, you know, anything at all, just give me a call. And so um, that night, I got a text, and it came from his mother, and his mom said, you know, I just can't thank you. I, I just want to say thanks so much. Um, my son, you, you had prayed for him. He was in such a battle because he wanted the baby so much, but his, his partner did not. And he has just for the past two months been so down. And, and he said, for the first time, I, I have sensed there's been an encouragement in his spirit. And she said, I don't know how often you go there, but I just thank you for your ministry because I couldn't be there. She said, I couldn't be there that day. And I wanted to be with my son, but God had put you there. And I just want to say thanks so much. And um, yeah, and, yeah. And so I, it was just one of those things. You just think for a moment, you don't know what's going on. And all of a sudden, God just says, hey, I got stuff. And so, um, anyway, you know, so I just wanted to say yes on those things where we, uh, you know, we just yield to the Lord, like Marcia was saying. Some are, are meant to be out, you know, here, and some are meant to be out there and doing this or doing that. And like, like Pastor Donna had said, just, you know, we're going to be fasting for opportunities. And opportunities can be when you wake up and you had a dream. That can be the opportunity. Or an opportunity can be, you know, it's from A to Z, like Brenda's saying. You know, we just we just being yielded, and we'll say, okay, okay Lord, I'll do whatever you, you want me to do. You know, so anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, what's really neat, too, about what you're saying is it just seems like the danger in this world is we dehumanize one another. You know, we set each other into categories and we put people in, you know, stacks of whatever, based on all kinds of qualifiers, what they believe, how old they are, what they look like, where they're from. But, but the truth of the matter is, is, is if we really allow God to do his work in us, I think part of what, he's need, what he helps us to strip away is we start to view each other as humans people who need who have needs you know and and, and that that's what i think um that's what what the devil wants to really rob from us is just that simplicity we're all people who have needs we're part of a family as i like to joke i mean most people don't realize they have a actually i'm now five foot six apparently i've actually grown a little but i'm a five foot six japanese brother that they've they've had their whole life they just didn't even know it right but we need one another. We're, we're part of this family, and, and I think that's what, how we can break through even a lot of the division. Because I think a lot of the division that's happened in this country is because everybody's making everybody else out to be uh, some kind of image of a position rather than, no, we're human. And we have needs, and we have desires, and we're struggling. And that's what needs to start to... But then also the, the, the other the key component to this, because I don't want to just leave it there. The key component is we need God as the solution. Wherever you are at, whatever you are going through today, the same answer applies to every single one, last one of us. We all need God. I just simply walked into a um, Dollar Tree and picked up what I needed. And this is just probably yesterday. And then um, I heard the, the young cashier. 
just say, I almost killed somebody yesterday. <laughs> and without even asking, I didn't ask if I could pray, but this just rose up in me. And I just, I just said, I just pray for peace for you. I pray for peace. And I, I watched her, her countenance change. And because she was talking to somebody else that was behind the cashier or the cash register. And I heard her say also, I needed that. And it was just a word. Thank you, Father. I love it. Yeah, I think what's, what's really cool about this service is that. Because I was asking God, you know, privately. I didn't. I said, "Well, Father, how's this supposed to go?" I mean, I'm I'm done with, with talking. And then what was really neat is, that then I, it was actually you, Brenda, as you're standing there. I just was wa like listening, and you're. It just seemed like we were quiet for a moment. I'm like, I think I'm gonna stay here. It's not time to move. And then that's when Lavinda came up, and it was really funny because it was just like unprompted it wasn't like i was trying to make something but i think what's cool is this everything has been edifying after that that was what my prayer was let it be edifying and also let it be a reminder of what like rather than us taking rabbit trails different directions let it be a reminder of what the core was right what was the core of what i was trying to get across today was is that the core of that revival if you will right where those three thousand were added one day was that they said, hey, God has poured out his spirit on all flesh. We're all supposed to be working with him for his purpose, for his um, mission. Doesn't look the same, but you're all called, right? Young men, older men, children, handmaids, all, you know, I was listing all these different people. You're all part of this picture. We're all part of this picture. And don't ask I might even challenge you with this. Don't ask what big thing you can do for God today. Maybe the prayer needs to be, what small things would you like me to do today? Maybe we need to work with that so that we can retrain our thinking and be like, not looking for this giant explosion of a thing, but what, what little thing do you need me to do today, Father? And you do those little things. It might just be like, and expect him, like you were talking about with inventory, maybe he just brings up, you know, you really need to overcome this little fear. Really, that's all you want me to do today? Yeah, that's it. And you do that one thing. But you're getting somewhere step by step, day by day. So with that said, I just want to pray for everybody. I feel like this is a good place. And I, I do want us to be able to, if there's anything that has to be done here, to do that separately. But I do want to pray so that I can release the online people who have been, joined us. So Father, I just pray that you would teach us how to work with you to do the things that you have called us to do to represent your purpose on this planet. Father, I pray that you would teach us not to compare ourselves to anyone else, but to be on call to do what you would have us to do for you and you alone. And Father, I pray that you would also remind us to always call out to you. Even when we say, I have a full belly and everything's fine, that we would still go, no, but I'm not fine because I need more than just a full belly. I need you every day. Father, in Jesus' name, amen. With that said, I would like to release our the online uh, people that have joined us. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, obviously, if you're near somebody and, you, and they're okay with it, you give them a hug and a smile as we say around here. But thank you very much for joining us. So I want to release them to go ahead and um, to go ahead and go 